Splidge the Cragflinger The Royal Tournament by Richard Vobes Read by Richard Vobes Chapter 1 It was always raining in the land of Gud. It never stopped, and umbrellas were essential. One boy who didn't have an umbrella was Splidge. He was dripping wet and soaked to the skin, and surprised the city hadn't flooded long ago. Seeking shelter, the boy ducked under the arch of the venerable market hall. The ancient timber-framed building sat on tall stone pillars in the city centre and made a perfect respite from the constant drizzle. As puddles formed around his shoes, Splidge shook the water from his bedraggled jacket and dried his sandy-coloured hair with a handkerchief. Blimey, he said, when he saw how wet it was. There's nothing croaked a voice, and Splidge spun round to see a filthy man dressed in rags emerging from the dark recesses of the undercroft. The beggar, who dragged his withered leg behind him, gawped at the boy for a moment. You wait till you're really wet, he grumbled, and then he hobbled out into the curtain of rain and limped away. Splidge watched the water cascading down the slate rooftops of the buildings opposite and flood into wrought iron gutters before it spewed out of hideous gargoyle spouts. These powerful jets of rainwater, he noticed, were a menace to pedestrians on the cobbled streets below. As if on cue, an elderly gentleman emerged from a tobacconist shop underneath one such jet and got drenched in an instant. He cursed loudly at his misfortune and shook his fist when he spied Splidge giggling at him. Boy, why didn't you warn me? The man crossed the road and bashed Splidge on the head with his folded umbrella, then stalked off, muttering to himself. As Splidge rubbed his sore head, he saw a girl rushing towards him. She had raven-coloured hair and wore a figure-hugging black leather outfit. She looked a little older than Splidge by a couple of years, and he wondered if all the girls in Gud City were like this stunning beauty. When she sheltered under the archway next to him, his heart missed a beat. Morning, Splidge said, staring at the tall, slender teenager, admiring her striking brown eyes and purple lips. She didn't reply. Instead, she gave him a dismissive nod. It's a bit wet today, Splidge continued, stating the obvious, but the girl had no interest in conversation. She scowled at her umbrella. Something was preventing the canopy from unfolding. Need some help? Splidge asked. No thanks, she said, through gritted teeth, pushing hard against the umbrella's toggle. I see you have a Hanway Supreme. They're supposed to be the best, but they can be problematic if the collar gets caught. The raven-haired girl gave the boy a snooty look. Talk a lot, don't you, she said, before moving away to another arch. Splidge followed, amused by her annoyance. I think the outer spring is twisted. It happens sometimes. It's the sign of bad craftsmanship. I can fix it if you like. Oh? The girl looked the boy up and down. He was younger than the usual rabble that tried to impress her. Splidge smiled. It's all right. My dad used to be a brolly man, so I know what to do. The young woman thought the boy looked trustworthy, so she handed him the broken rain protector and Splidge got to work. His stubby, nimble fingers quickly located the defective spring under the folds of material. With a flourish, he pushed the central toggle up and, as if by magic, the brolly opened with its familiar whoosh. Splidge winked. Easy, he said, and he returned the prize. The leather-clad girl took the umbrella and flashed the boy the barest hint of a smile. Thanks, she said, and then without waiting for a response, she stepped back out into the monsoon and hurried down the street. You're welcome, the boy grinned, catching a whiff of her exotic perfume. But alas, the sensory pleasure lingered all too briefly. Wow, she was lovely, Splidge thought, wishing she hadn't rushed off. A commotion made him look back to the cascade of water tumbling from the ugly monsters on the roof opposite, and he spotted a short, plump woman squealing with displeasure as she too received a drenching. 
Splidge stifled a laugh when the hapless crone scowled back at him. You should have warned me, you stupid imp! She spat in his direction and, swearing under her breath, stomped off. Splidge had to laugh. What a tantalising and comic introduction to the city. He'd only been there five minutes and witnessed two old people taking unintended showers and, incredibly, he'd fallen for a leather-clad girl with raven-coloured hair who he desperately wanted to meet again. Unfortunately, he couldn't hang about. His mother had sent him to look at the job advertisements which were pinned to the notice board in the market square. With reluctance, the young lad stepped back into the drizzle and set off to find them. Splidge had left home in darkness earlier that morning. He was exhausted after trudging for three hours along rutted, mire-filled tracks to reach the big city. Traffic poured through the great east gate. He dodged the splashes from travelling hawkers' ponies and clay thrown up by a train of pack horses. The merchants, eager to sell their wares, walked alongside their horses, urging the equine beasts onwards. The boy was astonished at how busy the city was that early in the morning. Some days it rained more than others, and that morning it bucketed down. Splidge cursed himself for not bringing his umbrella, stupid really, because like the raven-haired beauty, no one went anywhere without an umbrella. Of course, having one didn't always keep you dry, as the rain often defied the laws of gravity and swept horizontally under the protective canopy, showering you in the face. You just got used to rain in Gud. A young woman rushed along the path carrying a sheath of papers under her arm, and Splidge waved to her. Excuse me, my name is Splidge. I'm looking for the market square. Can you tell me where it is, please? The lady paused, pulling her bonnet tightly around her head. Well, young man, it's nice to meet you. My name is Jane. The market square is easy to find. Follow the road and you'll come to the town hall. And behind that is the market square. Good luck. Splidge thanked her and hurried off down the road. A handsome fellow, wearing a top hat, called urgently to the lady. Miss Austin, Miss Austin, wait a moment, you've left your purchases in my shop. You'll need the quills and ink when you write your next book. From the town hall, Splidge crossed into the market square. Although it was still not light, he could make out many of the properties surrounding it. There were shops, warehouses and offices, built of brick or timber. Some of them supported fine slate roofs, while thatched straw crowned others. Many tradesmen had already been open for hours, such as Mr Caxton, who printed the morning's newspapers. Other business owners arrived later and had only just started to remove the shutters on their shops. A few apprentices swept muck and dirt into the wide gutter running down the street, while men in aprons and sturdy boots set out their stalls. Splidge noticed that each premises had a sign-written board hung above it. He read a few of them as he passed. Wren and Hook, Architects. Mr Newton, Weights and Measures. And a pudding of a man wedging his shop door open was, according to his hoarding, a Mr Darwin, taxidermist and supplier of exotic stuffed animals. Sitting on a table outside Mr Darwin's shop was an array of rabbits, owls and squirrels, demonstrating his profession. Most peculiar of all was an ugly bird with a chicken's body and a pigeon's head. It had a very pronounced beak, shaped like a crescent moon. A rare example of a dodo. The stuffed creatures stared ominously from their wooden plinths. Splidge prodded one. What are you looking at, boy? bellowed the overweight proprietor, banging his fist on the door frame. Oh, uh, nothing, sir. Well, be off with you then, or I'll take you inside and replace your innards with horsehair and beeswax. In the centre of the market square, Splidge spotted the city notice board. He crossed over to it, shooing away half a dozen unattended hogs rooting in a smelly dunghill stacked close by. 
A few discarded chicken carcasses lay strewn across the cobbles and a pile of apple cores fermented in a puddle. What had happened to City Pride? Splidge scanned the enormous billboard. It had hundreds of notices, posters, advertisements and announcements pinned to it, all printed on sheets of vellum. There were plenty that mentioned lost pets or stolen animals, but most of them publicised services on offer. The number of official documents, such as municipal rules and regulations, alarmed him. A man in dark attire approached the boy and hammered his own notice on with the others. Hello, Sonny, his deep, resonant voice rasped. Mr Ketch at your service. Beheading is my business. Know anyone who requires his head removing? Splidge swallowed. Um, uh, no, sir. Sorry, I, I don't. Mr Ketch wiped his greasy hair away from his grubby face and glowered at the lad, eyeing up his neck with relish. Pity. Trade's been a bit quiet of late, he said, and he stalked away, taking with him an enormous axe. Splidge looked at the fella's notice with trepidation, but all it read was, Tree fella, same day service, reasonable rates. Splidge quickly looked for the job advertisements, which he found near the bottom of the board. There was one in particular that caught his eye. The wax seal and red ribbon intrigued him, and he squinted at the words. The rain running in rivlets down his face was almost forgotten. He tore the ink-smeared paper from the rusty nail which held it. It was an official document from the palace. The large, bold letters printed in black and gold looked impressive, but unfortunately the words were smudged, and only a few were still legible. All of a sudden it was wrenched out of his hands. "'What you got there?' demanded a tall, lanky boy. Uh, "'Nothing,' replied Splidge. The boy wore dirty, torn rags. His scrawny body was emaciated, and his haggard face had deep-set lines making him look old before his time. He glanced at the advertisement and then flung it on the ground in a temper. I thought it were food, he grumbled. You got anything to eat? I'm starving. Splidge felt sorry for the hungry boy and he rummaged in his pocket and produced an apple. You can have this if you like. The boy snatched the fruit. Thank you, he said, before rushing away as if his life depended on it. He tore down the street and disappeared into an alleyway. Splidge was astonished. He'd heard that the city was riddled with dangerous people and he'd been warned to be very careful. But that boy obviously needed food and Splidge felt glad that he'd been able to help him. Splidge picked up the fallen advertisement and studied it again. There was something about the young man's determined manner as he stood in the driving rain, deciphering the page of text in his hand. He appeared more grown up than he really was. He had only celebrated his twelfth birthday the day before, but in fact, it meant he had come of age. Splidge was now officially a man. From today, you must wear this jacket, his mother had told him before he left that morning. Is it my father's? Splidge asked, thrusting his arms into the ancient work coat his mother held out for him. No, it's your grandfather's. If your father had been here, he would have given you one of his. Splidge sighed. He's been gone for ages. It was very early in the morning and still dark, so Splidge held up a candle to look at his blind mother's kind face. Even though she couldn't see him, he knew she loved him very much. Yes, he's been away six long years, she said with a soft, gentle voice as she recalled the man she had married. Look, I have a cap for you too. Now that you're all grown up, you must go to the city and search for work. Splidge's mother was right. The laws of Gud required everyone to get a job when they reached the age of 12. From that point on, childhood finished, and boys and girls joined the workforce. Fortunately, young people had the best chance of finding work. By the time they reached their midlife, say at 20, employment proved a lot harder. By 30, they were unfit for work, and those beyond 40 found that the Gudian god was waiting to snatch them away. 
I don't want you to leave us, Splidge's mother said, filling a little bag with a few slices of bread and an apple. But it's your duty, and your father will be proud of you if he ever returns. I will be fine, Splidge replied, thinking of the great adventure ahead of him. He had lived in that old house all his life, and he couldn't wait to earn a living and help pay for things the way his dad used to. Splidge's mother buttoned up her son in readiness for the wet weather. If you are lucky, you might be taken on as an apprentice to a blacksmith, or become an assistant porter, or a trainee mason, or even a carpenter. Splidge wished that he could be an umbrella maker, like his father. But he knew it wasn't a proper job. People that couldn't get real work made brollies and sold them on the street. No one made a lot of money doing that, but at least it saved them from starving. The city was thriving. Herdsmen drove their oxen down the streets, and deliverymen unloaded barrels of ale at the inns and taverns from their heavily laden wagons. That morning, the proprietor of the Crown Hotel gave animated instructions to the driver of the Guddian Fly, a stagecoach with six fine horses, which were chomping at the bit, eager to leave. An assortment of wealthy travellers and sales representatives were crammed into the carriage. Dressed in all their finery, they flashed broad smiles, revealing their pleasure in leaving the dirt-ridden city. They were in striking contrast to the lad, standing by the notice board in his shabby, second-hand, sopping wet attire. Nevertheless, Splidge's old-fashioned, moth-eaten and ill-fitting clothes made him feel grown up and important. It was just a shame that, due to its great age and loss of protective wax coating, his jacket acted like a huge sponge and soaked up the rainwater. Hello, Splidge, a voice called. Splidge looked up and spotted a scruffy boy of similar age to him, clinging precariously to the top of a lamppost on the other side of the square. He crossed over to him and stared up at the lad with mild amusement. What are you doing up there, Snotty? I'm snuffing it, the lamp boy said matter-of-factly, and he thrust a small conical brass instrument over the flame and put it out. He slid down the lamppost to join his friend. I've got a new job. I'm a lighter and snuffer now, he proclaimed proudly. The lamps of Gud are my responsibility, you know. Blimey, Splidge said, impressed. That's a good job. Splidge was small, but Snotty was smaller. No one had measured him, yet he could only muster four feet, even in his boots and battered top hat. A mixture of lamp oil, candle wax, soot and ash covered his ragged jacket and trousers. His cheery face exhibited a ruddy complexion and his nose constantly dribbled, which was not helped by his habit of thrusting his little finger into his encrusted nostrils and mining for bogies. Yeah, it's a good job, but with all that shimmying up and down these posts, he's wearing stinking great holes in me trousers. Snotty slapped the lamp post. Still... It's better than being a sluicer. A what? Not a lot of people know this, but under our feet are miles of subterranean tunnels. Really? What are they for? They're the drains, to wash all the muck out to the river. Splidge nodded. It sounded plausible. So what about them? They get blocked, don't they? Do they? Snotty laughed, hoiking out a crumbly green lump from his nose with his blackened fingernail. Yeah, blocked all the bleeding time, so you need a sluicer. Splidge tried to imagine what that must be like, to be sent down the sewers with all the filth, slime and rubbish that is funnelled through the vents in the pavement. Earlier that morning, he'd spotted Mr Chops the butcher tipping a bucket of cow offal into the kennel, a thin channel in the middle of the lane in front of his shop. The stinking intestines had slipped down the road until they plopped through the drainage hole. After that, he now knew they ended up in the tunnels below his feet and mixed with all the other putrid sludge. Yuck! Snotty saw the look on Splidge's face. Yeah, it's not nice. You have a paddle which scoops up the slops and you shovel it along. You have to clear the blockages sometimes with your bare hands. I mean, imagine it up to your waist in turds and floating carcasses. I don't want to imagine it. Well, that was my first job when I came to the city. Snotty chuckled, wiping a streak of soot across his face. 
Splidge followed the grubby midget to the next lamppost. Here the sooty lad displayed the dexterity of a chimpanzee by climbing up its fluted shaft. With practice ease, Snotty slammed the snuffing tool over the gas fueled wick and then glided effortlessly down to the muddy ground once more, casting a broad smile across his cheeky face. He enjoyed showing off. Bravo! applauded Splidge. They'd been friends for as long as they could remember. When not helping their parents, not collecting firewood, not hauling well water by the bucket load, not digging for turnips, not grinding corn, and not sitting around the kitchen table assembling umbrellas to sell to the merchants, they ran a mock. Snotty had reached manhood a couple of months before his curly-haired friend, and soon latched on to the reality of earning his keep. The heady days of youth were now distant memories. Childhood evaporated fast. So what about you, Splidge? Have you started looking for a job? Yeah, my mother wants me to try and get something at the palace. Snotty rolled his eyes. What, work for the king, that lazy lump? What do you mean? My father said the king was a good man. Then he must be the only one that thinks so. Since I've been lighting the lamps, all I hear is folk moaning about him. Why? Snotty gestured to the square. Well, look at the place. It's a pigsty. King Guddermack has let it go to rack and ruin, ain't he? Splidge agreed. The squalid streets and dilapidated buildings would require a huge investment to make the city grand again. Besides, the filthy lamp boy mused, flicking bogies into space, the palace is run by a bunch of old farts. He broke off as two girls came running towards them across the wet cobbles, splashing through the puddles, without a care in the world. Look out! warned Snotty with a big smile. It's the Terror Twins. Splidge laughed. I thought they were triplets. Didn't you hear? Peaky died. She got the pox. Oh, how awful, Splidge said. Malnutrition and poverty caused terrible suffering in Gud, especially for the young. However, when it came, death was still a shock. The girls thundered to a halt and grinned at the boys. They were dressed in grubby cotton pinafores over a coarse blouse, and they each clasped an umbrella. They had to be earning a good wage, as they both wore quality boots made from leather. "'What are you doing?' the tallest girl asked. Snotty tried to wipe the soot away from his face, but only made it worse. "'Working. And you, Freckles?' "'We've got a job with Mr Chops at the butchers,' the smallest girl said. "'It's true,' the tallest added. We don't get to hack up the meat yet, but there's loads of blood. Yeah, mostly we pluck chickens and mince up pigs' brains, but it's honest work. Blimey, Splidge expressed surprise. I never thought I'd see the day when you, Lucy Long Trousers, had a job, he laughed. I mean, I thought you were going to marry a rich man and live in a posh house. Hm, <laughs> that's just a schoolgirl's dream. No rich man's ever going to marry me unless you make a fortune quick, Splidge she said, giving the boy a cheeky smile. And then, more seriously, she said, I have to work, cos I'd starve without a job, wouldn't I? Are you got something yet? Splidge started to tell them about the advertisement he'd found on the notice board, but Freckles, the smallest girl, interrupted him. Here, yeah. have you heard? Porky's up the brewery. No, he never is, Snotty frowned. Yeah, only working for... You know who? Who? Splidge asked. The Baron, Lucy Longtrousers answered. Who? Splidge asked again. The Baron, that's who. Anyway, Porky, he's a liquor. Snotty scoffed. He does what? He, he drinks the liquor? Now that's the sort of job I'd like to do. Freckles poked the sooty-faced lad in the ribs. Stupid, he's a label liquor. She could see that the boys didn't understand and rolled her eyes at their ignorance. You daft nitwits. Freckles grinned at them. Porky's sticking labels on the beer bottles at the brewery. He licks them and sticks them. But that's dangerous. The gum will kill him. Snotty knitted his eyebrows together. You think so? Freckles said. What's the matter with the gum? Splidge knew nothing about what went on at the big smelly brewery. It's the stuff they stick the labels to the bottles with. It's made of some chemical the Baron uses because it's cheap. But rumour has it, it's poisonous. Snotty said. Is it? Yeah, very. Do you remember Larry Lame? 
Um, you know, the lad with the limp and the withered arm. Oh yeah, how could I forget him? Older boy, wasn't he? He left school before us. Yeah, well, he worked for the Baron, like Porky. He licked them labels and he turned green. He was dead within a month. Blimey. A short period of silence followed as they respectfully remembered one of their friends. Snotty made the sign of the cross and they looked sad for a moment. The grim reality of life affected them all, but they were soon laughing and joking again. After more gossiping, the girls had to return to work before Mr Chops came searching for them with his hatchet. He worked his apprentices hard and didn't tolerate any slackness, so the girls hurried back, skipping through the puddles. I can't hang about either, Snotty said. There's another hundred of these lamps to put out. Thing is, when I gets them all out, <laughs> it's blinking time to light them all up again. Still, no rest for the wicked, eh? The sooty-faced boy dashed off to another lamppost and shimmied up to do his duty. Splidge watched him for a moment, envious that Snotty and the girls had jobs. Then he remembered the piece of paper. The royal advertisement had gone mushy in Splidge's hands. Although he couldn't read all the words, he knew he must apply for the job. Regardless of what people said about the king, Splidge's father had, at one time, made umbrellas for the royal household. These days, however, the palace employed very few people. It was rumoured that King Gadamak had no money, food and lodgings at the palace were said to be sparse, and as supreme leader, the royal gud, King Gadamak had become a big fat lardy lump, miserable as sin and hard to please. Working at the palace did have the advantage of prefixing your work title with the prestigious sounding label Royal. That excited Splidge, and he looked again at the slowly disintegrating advertisement in his hand. His Majesty, the Royal Gud, is seeking a... smudge. To come and work for him at the palace. The new employee will be well rewarded and expected to... smear in the national... big blotch. Experience was... mush. The rest of it had washed away. It didn't matter. Splidge got the gist, and he grinned. He didn't care what the actual job involved. He'd be happy sweeping the chimneys, cleaning out the pigs, or even stoking the furnace all day with hefty lumps of coal. Splidge knew that the prospect of getting hired made his mother proud. The family needed a breadwinner. Because with her disability she couldn't do everything on her own, as well as looking after Weenie, Splidge's sister, Splidge made up his mind. He would apply for the job. He marched confidently out of the square with the remains of the soggy paper held tightly in his hand, determined to do his best. Unbeknown to Splidge, his every move had been secretly observed. A pair of grey eyes, deep set in a piggy face, stared out from behind two large rubbish bins. The containers overflowed with hay, straw, husks and rotting vegetables on the far side of the market square. The watcher had lurked there for most of the morning, his fat, dishevelled body propped up against the wall and protected from the driving rain by the canopy of Defoe's Coffee Emporium. He looked like a man who had spent the night stuffing mouthfuls of fatty food into his face. Not only that, the bulky, lazy slob appeared to have guzzled far more ale than was truly good for him. And this was exactly what he wanted everyone to think. The overweight, balding, chubby-faced wreck of a man had been coming to the square every day for a week now. He had not always resumed residence behind the bins. He varied his observation points and blended into the background. Yet, without exception, he concentrated his manic stare on the market notice board. If anyone showed the slightest interest in the royal advertisement, then his employer wanted to know about it. That day, after eyeballing the twelve-year-old boy, the man with the hog-like features had some significant news to tell his boss.